Thanks for joining me today, James. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, so I'm really curious uh, to hear more and learn more about the Intentional Society project that you've been doing for a while and uh, would love to dive into that and hear more about it. But maybe we could just start by uh, hearing from you more about who you are personally and, and kind of your own life story and background and anything that you'd like to share about yourself. Wow. Oh. Life story, eh? How long do we have? <laughs> yeah, as long as you like. <laughs> yeah. Well, hmm. it's um, looking back. Um, I don't know. Do you ever look back on your life? And you just like, um, I suppose in one sense, you look at everything you've done and you go like, oh, wow, everything that I've done in my life has prepared me to be where I am right now doing what I'm doing. And somehow everything was perfect and, and um, just right. Uh, but it, uh, but it sure doesn't look, you know, it sure doesn't look that way when you're going through it. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I suppose maybe the thing I'll say is I'll, I'll kind of give a little time portal back mm. into childhood James and, mm. and growing up. Uh, cause there were, there were two things I think that maybe shaped me pretty profoundly growing up. Uh, one was gifted kid syndrome, mm. uh, like being smart, testing well into the whatever gifted program in, in kindergarten or anything, like being told that I was really smart. Like that was, that, that was, you know, profound in terms of what, uh, what I thought mattered and how I thought I was valuable, you know, and how I earned my, my worth and, and love. Uh, and, the other thing is growing up in, in the religious community that uh, I did, which was a kind of conservative, uh, evangelical, Pentecostal uh, flavor of Christianity. And so very much like a literal kind of like save the world uh, mindset and, and motif, like very directly great commission, evangelism, missions, go out and save the world. Uh, and that, you know, probably swirled together with that gifted kid syndrome stuff. Um, I think I came out of it with sort of a like, hmm, figure out the world, solve the world, mm -hmm. uh, figure out what's wrong with everything and what would the ways to make things right. And I don't know, so that's kind of the, the bent or orientation uh, that I think I came out of my, you know, environment of, of origin. Mm -hmm. And what, what did you kind of do coming out of childhood and becoming an adult? Like what is kind of the trajectory of your, or your life been since childhood? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, um, I came out, uh, yeah, as a, as a teenager in high school or like, kind of like did the like lead everything, win everything, compete at everything, be the best at everything. Uh, and, um, you know, got tired of that by the, about the middle of undergrad uh, in college uh, there. But um, computers, I watched some Star Trek too. Uh, I used to come home every day after middle school and flop on the couch and watch Next Generation. Uh, and so, uh, I don't know, I wanted to go build command, Commander Data uh, or something like that. So I was into computers and tech uh, and did some hardware and some software uh, and then some AI uh, too. And then, uh, yeah, after, after that, uh, came out here to Seattle, uh, where I still am today, but this was um, 14 or so, 14, 15 years almost at this point. Uh, and um, yeah, did several years of software, uh, writing, wrote a lot of software, uh, then did some, some managing, uh, and then did some uh, process process and practices work. Uh, and that was really interesting for me being at this growing company where everything kept breaking year after year that, you know, the team would be 50% larger uh, and all of the ways that we communicated and worked and all of those things would, would keep breaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so trying to keep up with that really got me into system thinking uh, and system level awareness and process awareness and why and how do we do the things that we do on the individual, but on the team and the org and the department and the company level and all these different scales. And so that, um, that really set me on a different path 
uh, in life. Uh, and I, I worked as kind of this process specialist uh, for, for years. And yeah, that was what got me into to also some of the, um, the uh, psychology uh, and, well, cause, cause pulling on all of these, you know, systemic gnarly problems, like so much of it is the human element uh, and what people are doing and the incentives that they're responding to and, and our emotions and our motivations and our subconscious selves and, and all of that. So um, that got me into psychology and adult development uh, and coaching various kinds of, of different coaching um, and uh, yeah, lots of lots of stuff that is relevant, you know, as I now point towards, you know, kind of intentional society uh, and my my current work. But um, but yeah, I was I was very fortunate and had a lot of fun and got to do a lot of fun things. And uh, yeah, and I'm glad to be done with that mm. phase of my life now, too. Mm. What did it look like when you were a sort of process specialist? What kinds of things did you work on or implement or try at the company you're at? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I specialized in things that were both technical and people oriented. So mm -hmm. we had um, several hundred people in this engineering department, and we were trying to figure out how to um, simplify our code management. Uh, you, you check in code on different branches and you integrate those branches together. Uh, and But ch changing the way that we worked, this was, you know, affected everything from the individual person. How did they test their code and how did they review their code and how did they check in their code on a daily basis to how did that add up to the bigger streams and currents of code flow, so to speak, uh, and how would those remain stable and how would we test those and how would we do the integrations? And uh, so uh, getting, the, getting the engineering department from many branches down to one branch uh, and getting our release schedule from a once a year release schedule to a once every quarter uh, and doing, you know, mini loops, mini cycles of six weeks each, rather than these big, um, long, year-long, like, code, code, code yourself uh, into, you know, a quality hole, and then bug fix, bug fix, bug fix your way out of the quality hole mm -hmm. uh, towards a much more kind of continuous delivery, continuous integration uh, type of state. So those are some of my big projects. Mm -hmm. How did... Uh that lead you to learning about things like adult development and psychology? Yeah, well, uh, the, the simple act, I'll take the simple act of checking in a piece of code. Mm. You know, say you work for a few hours or a few days, uh, but you wanna check in your code. Uh, the, the questions around what do you do as an individual? Um, there, are, there are certain norms and agreements, the rules, you know, the, the department can have a set of rules say, oh, this is what you do. You know, you run this checklist on your code uh, as you check it in. And that's how you assure quality. And that's how you do your part uh, to assure the shared quality of this shared code base that hundreds of people are all trying to contribute to. You can maybe see some of the analogy already to communities uh, and community norms and how do we get along and how do we how do we build uh, communities and societies for ourselves. Uh, but um, yeah, the the important parts of those decisions that each individual would make, uh, they really came down to what's relevant to them in their day to day. Like there's there's both the consideration of how's my work gonna look to my manager uh, or to my teammates on my small close team? How, uh, what sort of incentives do I have to, you know, push this next bit of feature functionality in versus doing this refactoring over here uh, that might leave the code more long-term maintainable, but won't be a snazzy shiny feature that we can advertise or show off as a, wow, look at what our team did. Hmm. Uh, and so there are some of the trade-offs of short-term versus long-term individual incentive versus team incentive uh, and things like that, that, um, that you've got to reckon with uh, hmm. and you've got to recognize and you got to put those things on the table and say, okay, how can we support these people holistically to do the right thing? 
because if they're not supported to do the things that they want to do, everybody wants to keep uh, high quality. Uh, everybody wants to keep the branch green. Nobody wants to break the code that somebody else has to deal with. Uh, everybody wants to be a good citizen. But if you don't support people holistically in doing that, then you can end up with a situation which we were in sometimes where the the code was red. We, we, there's a red green testing uh, analogy, you know, green, good, red, bad kind of thing, uh, where the um, where the, the tests would just stay red and stay red and people would try to fix them and they'd stay red and you know, they'd be broken faster and more often than people could fix them mm. uh, and would get into a, a, a feedback loop cycle uh, like that. And once you get into that state, people would go like, oh, well, everything's bad anyway. Like I'm not gonna make, much, make it much worse myself, right? So send, <laughs> you know, <laughs> dump their, their code in and cause, um, cause why wouldn't they uh, if everybody else is? Uh, or if there's no feasible thing that they could do to make the overall situation better. So, um, so yeah, I, I focused on trying to connect the, the large scale with the small scale. Uh, and it's as much of a social construct sometimes uh, as it is anything about the technology or the technological rules or the, the, uh, the various code or the tests that we were running. Uh, it was the psychology of, do I believe that everybody else is doing the right thing mm -hmm. for whatever definition of right is. Uh, and so am I going to do the right thing? And what happens if there are, you know, what happens if there's friction uh, on the path uh, and something pops up? Uh, do I, you know, do I believe that this is a flaky test uh, or not? Do I ignore it or not? All of those decisions, which seem, you know, very small and personal, like, oh, it's just, it's just a few lines of code, or it's just one check-in, uh, you know, and how that relates to the overall whole mm. and the, the, the health uh, and thriving. You can use almost organic metaphors for a code base of how healthy is it and is it thriving? Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like... Um sort of psychological variables and even metaphors helped you construct a, a like a development environment that was more stable and, and uh, reliable than it otherwise would have been. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And seeing, seeing how things joined on the different scopes at the different levels seemed to put me in a pretty, um, unique place for mm. where I was uh, positioned within that org to, to kind of come up with some, some designs to see some visions uh, and, to, um, and to rally uh, hundreds of people uh, at this point uh, towards change uh, and towards improvement. Mm. And when that worked, gosh, that was like, that was one of the best feelings in the world mm. uh, when that worked. And when we could all, you know, we could all see the difference and we could all say like, oh yeah, all right. We finally, we made this thing better for mm. ourselves. That's been bugging us for years. Mm. Go, go us, you know, as a team and to feel that, yeah, to feel, uh, you know, maybe going back to the gifted kid syndrome, but like to feel special and to feel like, mm. like, oh, I saw this, you know, I helped, you know, I was the key or I was important, you know, to putting this all together and leading people towards, you know, this, this new, uh, better equilibrium. Mm. Um, yeah, mm. feels good. Yeah, I, I can imagine that. Uh, what, what were you, what were you seeing that other folks weren't seeing? And what did you do to sort of change things in, in broad strokes. I'm sure some of it was pretty technical, but uh, what were you seeing and what did you do? Yeah. At the, at the broad strokes, I did, I mean, through, through my awareness, through my, through my tenure, I was there a long time, mm -hmm. uh, through my knowledge and expertise and my, and my thinking, I was able to, I was able to put together some pretty crafty and, you know, intriguingly, cohesive sets of, uh, you know, kind of designs mm. uh, at times. And so, uh, so I was a good designer, a system, mm. system, human system process designer. Uh, but also, also it was a story of, of kind of going for it or kind of picking up uh, the, the, the nobody's job, like 
there's the system and who's in charge of the system, but we're all, we're all a piece of the system. Uh, and very oftentimes there's kind of no one uh, at various different scopes who has a direct corporate responsibility, you know, as their job title uh, to do these kinds of things. So I don't know, I started picking up projects just on the side, hmm. you know, as the team grew uh, and those worked uh, and I leaned more into it and that turned into an official role hmm. down the road. Uh, and so in another sense, it was just like, I had done enough to be in that space where most other people like had other jobs, hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't, wasn't their main responsibility. And uh, uh, even sometimes there was even a like, oh, well, all right, that's your, James will figure it out. <laughs> like, all right, uh -huh. what's next? Um, kind of, uh, kind of division there. But, um, but yeah, it's just kind of putting in the time and the, and the effort uh, and seeing uh, the, being in a place being in a place, you know, it's not because I was some super genius uh, that I was in that role, uh, but it was because I had practiced uh, paying attention to those things, and I had practiced thinking, and I and I thought about those things so much and for so long uh, that those systemic aspects, um, you know, I could see them working mm. in the system, uh, and I could see better than most how they were movable and mm. changeable. Uh, and how to work with them. Mm, fascinating, fascinating. That's so cool that you sort of carved out uh, like a role that would help the the team that you were on in that way. Um, yeah, yeah. I could imagine that being really like enjoyable and rewarding to see yeah. the fruits of that work. Yeah, it was fantastic mm. and wonderful and amazing, and you know, couldn't be happier kind of job uh, until it wasn't, mm. <laughs> and it right. all flipped around and stopped working. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What, um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you more about what intentional society is and we'll dive into that, but it, it makes me curious, like what preceded the creation of intentional society and like what kinds of things you were thinking about or longing for or, mm -hmm. or, or something like that. What, what sort of preceded the creation of this project? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, well, in one sense, I could say my whole life mm -hmm. preceded mm -hmm. uh, this project, but, um, but actually the past four years or so, uh, and, you know, I made a reference to things stopped working uh, about, you know, being the change agent there in that org. And that actually ties right into, yeah, uh, the transformation and the what, what was I longing for? Uh, that uh, as I, I don't know, as I grew uh, and as I, you know, exited and left uh, that kind of situation, like what I'm, what I'm still longing for and, and how I'm going after it now. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a bit of a complicated story, but um, I think the key, the key part of it uh, that, that I should probably share is um my own inner transformation mm -hmm. that I hit uh, doing this. Because uh, I, I went from, um, you know, I went from being a, a, you know, locally lauded, you know, hero type figure and uh, whom everybody knew and liked and appreciated to as we, as we grew, as we continued to grow and, and reach, you know, a thousand person engineering department, uh, some of the ways that I'd gotten really good at leading things started backfiring and how, how to deal, well, first I didn't deal with that very well at all. Uh, like I, I, you know, was used to pushing people and, and leading people and pushing people to adopt things and follow me and, and all of that. And um, I pushed harder, you know, like when, when it uh, got harder to push, I, I cranked up the energy uh, and pushed harder and, well, got a lot more stressed, uh, to be honest. So, but when, uh, I found when I, when I pushed people harder, uh, they started pushing back. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and when less people knew me, uh, and the, I don't know, the, the mechanisms that I'd been working with and working on no longer, 
uh, no longer succeeded in the way that they did. Uh, and the org was bigger and there was less kind of baseline default trust. Uh, and there were more layers of executives in the hierarchy. Uh, and so the up and down communication and the, what's the metaphor, the air cover of the ground war, um, militaristic metaphor uh, for change efforts there. But um, all of those things uh, started uh, getting harder. And so when my strengths started to backfire, that was really an existential crisis kind of moment for me mm -hmm. of like, oh, what, pff, what good am I now? Uh, the, the, all the stuff I'm good at, like, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, what am I going to do? Even who, who am I? If I'm not these things, if I'm not these strengths, these skills, these way of leading, what am I and what do I have left? Uh, so that was, um, so that was a real like kind of crisis for me, uh, existential crisis and, um, personal transformation, uh, in the end that, uh, I'd, I'd learned kind of just enough in the, in the coaching kind of worlds, uh, agile coaching, leadership coaching, uh, peer coaching. And one of the things that I'd, um, gotten hooked onto is adult development. Uh, and so this is Keegan or Keegan stages is the simplistic like thing that most people have, have heard of, uh, but just adult development and how we grow overall. And I knew just enough of this field to go, oh, well, maybe there's, maybe there's something else waiting for me. Mm. If I let go of all this stuff that seems so central to my identity and that I've gotten so good at, and that I'm holding on to so tightly maybe I could let go of it. Uh, and so, um, yeah, over one long Christmas break, uh, took a few extra weeks off and um, really dove into it and um, kind of let go of everything. Kind of felt like, you know, this backwards trust fall, mm -hmm. uh, you know, into like, okay, I don't know what's going to happen, but all right, let's try this and trusting and, and it, you know, the sensation that I found waiting for me in that fall uh, was not of being dashed on the rocks, but instead like, oh, I'm flying. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, wait, suddenly I'm so free and light and more expansive. And oh, oh there are all these new options mm -hmm. open to, to me that I couldn't even see before. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's hard to even like put, words to pithily here but um but that transformation uh which to put it in keegan terms maybe i'd say it like i was um letting go of some of the limits of my own self-authoring mm -hmm. and tippy toeing into the edge of what is a self-transforming perspective mm -hmm. look like uh that that seed of a transformation was profound for me uh and you know, changed my life and changed how I looked at myself and the world and the relationships and everything about that. Uh, and yeah, that's the kind of maybe like the direct on-ramp then uh, throughout the next three or four years to uh, showing up differently, uh, holding myself differently uh, and my relationships differently uh, and leading me to a, uh, a place where, yeah, with, with intentional society, I want to take a lot of the things that I that I did learn uh, about you know, organization building and you know effective teams and coordination and uh, all of that all of that nice you know modernity uh, stuff uh, machinery efficiency and you know figuring out there's a lot of of expertise uh, and wisdom there uh, but um, but taking that, you know, from modernity to post-modernity to meta-modernity, uh, to, to use those terms, uh, but really to step into uh, a wider and more, mm, more human space, a more human and a more holistic and a more uh, expansive awareness. And to be able to hold that awareness and to share that awareness with others and expand that and to build a group in that kind of awareness. Um, oof, yeah, that's, um, that's what lights me up. Mm, mm. 
That's beautiful to hear about. And I imagine this might be tricky to describe. And if it is, that's okay. But um, what was the process of letting go like for you? What, what did you do to let go of whatever it was that you were holding on to? Hmm. I suppose one answer could be cognitive diffusion, hmm. uh, which as a, as a technical term, I guess I'll shill uh, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. Hmm. Uh, and, and there's definitely one piece of it. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll shill for therapy in general. Like, <laughs> oh, it's amazing. And if you can, if you can find, uh, you know, a, a good fit and a good therapist there, like, Oh, that really did help me. Um, but the uh, the cognitive diffusion part of that there uh, is kind of decoupling things that were fused together, mm. false false equalities. Mm. Uh, when I when I say the kind of like, who am I if I'm not these strengths that are such a part of my character, or my self identity? Well, that's a coupling there. Mm. of like oh i am these things well okay yeah but what if you're not mm. what if you pull those apart uh and asking some questions of like oh well what if i'm not or what if i let go and just kind of being able to turn and look at and face those things and ask those questions i think getting past the the flinch or the UG field or the involuntary way that we kind of like shy away from those things that are aversive and uncomfortable. When you turn to face them, and when I asked myself questions like, am I okay if I give up being good at this thing? And just staring at it and facing it, I found actually that you know, there's kind of that like, oh, that the defenses were actually causing more harm than good as far as protecting me uh, mm -hmm. from these scary things. Facing the scary thing, it would kind of dissolve. And I'd look at myself and go like, oh, well, I'd still be alive. I'd still have my family and my, my, my wife and kids. And I'd still have this job. And I'd still like, and oh, I, I guess I'd be okay. Uh -huh. maybe even mm -hmm. though this seems really scary but like oh yeah i i might be okay is <laughs> kind of uh maybe that's the best i can do to transmit kind of the process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of going through that yeah it does give me a sense of it it does give me a sense of it um i wonder if there's uh again this this might be a tricky question to answer and if it is no problem but um if there's like if you can give an example of some kind of situation that you were in at the time that you saw a certain way then and that you would see differently now, how you might describe kind of like a before and after of like, oh, I thought it was this way, but it, now I see it this way kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah, let me search around. Hmm. I'm not sure if this fits the question exactly, but what's popping into my head was the way, kind of the way that I used to look at people and look mm. at at engineers, software developers, uh, various sorts on these teams, and uh, the way I used to approach, I don't know, the formerly the the optimization problem involving humans and their incentives, mm. and uh, I actually, you know, used the phrase behavioral engineering mm. uh, of like, oh, okay, well, these people are like, okay, inputs and outputs, incentives, levers, behavior. All right, well, so how do we, uh, how do we pull the right levers and crank the right gears and, you know, out the other side comes whatever desired behavior. Um, but that was the desired behavior that, that I wanted out of them mm -hmm. uh, that I thought would, you know, make the system work well or uh, whatever the design was. Um, but it's, um, but I look back on that now and go like, okay, so mm, maybe a good heart, good intention for like the whole system to work better, but like also kind of manipulative. Mm. 
in, in terms of um, yeah, just viewing other people as kind of the, the cogs, you know, in kind of the mechanistic view of the of the system, and yeah, the there's there's just an entirely different mindset, uh, which is maybe why this sprang to mind here uh, at that at that question uh, of um, that recoils now the 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 me of now looking at kind of the mechanistic mindset and kind of the trying to trying to push and force and make things you know fall into place and and happen according to my design uh i look at that now and go like oh how much more powerful would that have been if i had actually had a more deep and more profound love and respect for all of those humans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if instead of trying to like carrot and stick, uh, you know, people into doing the quote unquote right thing, um, how much deeper would it have gone as an invitation, as a human to human connection and invitation and I guess co-creation mm. would mm. be the spirit, the right spirit, the right word there to describe uh, that kind of approach. Because uh, really at the, at the largest scales, what I was trying to do was shift culture you know, that nebulous, ambiguous uh, word that nobody really knows what it means precisely, mm. uh, but the culture of the org and the way that we did our work uh, and the way that we related to the whole and, and each other. Uh, and so the thing, yeah, the thing now uh, is, you know, I might put it in terms of, of polarity management and polarity thinking, uh, the both and, uh, versus the either or just as a general motif. Uh, but, um, but yeah, just uh, the, the depth of, I guess, I'll just even say what I feel now. Uh, the depth of what I can, can feel and connect with in empathy and compassion and connection with other beings um yeah i feel like i just want to gesture off into the into the air and go like oh maybe you get it uh, -huh. uh and maybe yeah. maybe other folks can can grasp something that um still feels ineffable uh -huh. uh, inside of that yes. uh but yeah i don't know i'll check in how did that land with with whatever question uh, that you thought you were asking uh, versus whatever I was answering. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, that's great. I, I, I get a sense of sort of how you saw things before and uh, how you see things now. And it, it felt like, uh, got like a, a, yeah, a visceral understanding of it. So I appreciate that. Um, you mentioned towards the end of it, something that you called uh, polarity thinking. Can you talk more about what that is and and yeah, just what that is? Sure, yeah. And if you go, want, want to go look up, uh, polarity management is the phrase and Barry Johnson is the name mm. uh, dating back to the 70s. I kind of, um, you know, introduced uh, that as a technical term, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just going to briefly say that maybe polarities is the art of paradox. Mm. Uh, and the art of uh, holding a big enough space to make room for things that seem contradictory, uh, but um, a polarity is a pair uh, of things that are both good things. So this isn't a like good, bad, pro, con type of thing. It's oh, I have this good thing over here and I have this other good thing over here and they're in tension with each other. Uh, one of the common examples is giving feedback to somebody. Uh, you want to you want to give them honest, uh, useful feedback, and you want a good relationship with mm. them. And you want to be, you know, kind, nice, happy feeling. You know, the, um, 
And there's kind of, there's a tension between those two things. Uh, and so there's a book called Radical Candor. Uh, I think Kim Scott is the, the author of that. Uh, and Radical Candor is about, okay, how do you bring uh, empathy and caring personally along with directness and giving honest, direct feedback? And the, the trick to the, the polarity is not to like pick one side or the other, I'm going to swing over here, or I'm going to swing over there. It's, all right, these things are intention. There's not an easy solution. There's not a just like, you know, oh, snip, snap. All right, now I've got all the best of both worlds and none of the downside. Like, okay, that can, there's a, that would be referred to as an integration of a polarity, kind of integrating, decomposing them in ways such that you can get, you know, the most of the good parts uh, on both sides of the tension. Uh, and integrating polarities is a worthwhile endeavor whenever you run into one. Um, but it's uh, it's not a problem. A polarity is not a problem that you can just solve and be done solving. Uh, a polarity is a tension that has to be managed and continually managed over time. And so polarity management, um, and uh, if you go look that up, uh, you can find a, 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 some pictures of a, a sort of a figure eight uh, flowing in a figure eight. That's our natural tendency to kind of lean one way and get the positives and then lean too hard and get the negatives. Uh, and so then we swing over to the other side uh, to get the positives of the other part of the, you know, the other hand, the other part of the tension and then, you know, oscillate around. So being aware of those tensions and of those polarities um, takes us out of the business of trying to solve unsolvable things mm -hmm. uh, and being in a space where we can kind of hold the tension, hold the conflict and make room for it and being able to go, yes, both of those things. Um, even though their intention and parts of them might straight out conflict with each other uh, and in each micro moment you're making decisions of okay which way do I go and what what do I pick but um, anyway uh, yeah rich field there uh, and a lot of depth to what's a pretty simple concept but um, I think it's pretty foundational but it's just a pretty important one. Hmm. Hmm. I, I'm recalling how a big theme in my own life in the last year or so has been like uh, seeing again and again that in every situation there are trade-offs and uh, yeah really struggling with how to make those trade-offs and it seems like that might be a way to uh, learn to work with situations that have have trade-offs that aren't, aren't aren't easy to decide yeah, yeah. um I'm getting the sense from hearing you describe it that it's something like it, it also reminds me of um uh I don't know if it's sort of similar or different, but um are you familiar with evaporating clouds from the logical thinking processes? Not actually, no. Uh do you know the theory of constraints? Uh Goldratt's theory of constraints? Yep. Uh he had this whole other thing called the logical thinking processes, which were like a sequence of yeah, like it was like you do these processes in this order and you can come up with uh, solutions to complex and complicated problems. And um, one of them is like, it's like the fourth one or third or fourth one, you find uh, some kind of conflict. It, the, the sort of plain, for each of them, there's like the original name that he gave them. And then there's like a more plain English na name that uh, is more understandable. And the, the plain English name is a conflict resolution diagram. Um, but um, the idea is like, it's actually a pretty simple diagram. It's like, there's two um, like desires that are in, they're in logical conflict that you cannot possibly do both of them. Like, uh, you know, um, buy a house and don't buy a house. You cannot both buy a house and not buy right, a house. Right. Um, and that's where the conflict tends to come up. It's like one person's like, we have to buy the house. And one person's like, we can't buy the house. And you're like, well, we can't do both of those, sorry. Uh, but then, then, then there's like a node under each of those, which is the need for each of those. So it's like the house is, um, you know, wanting safety and then not buying a house is like having flexibility with your money or something like that. Uh, and it's like, those actually aren't in logical conflict. It's possible to have both safety and flexibility with your money. And then you kind of, there's different ways to frame the question, but you can be like, okay, how is it, how could we meet both the need for safety and flexibility or like, you can ask like, 
is there a way we could buy the house and have financial flexibility or right. could we not buy the house and still meet our need for safety? Uh, and um, yeah, there's another part of the diagram that's sort of the shared concern underneath both of those needs. But mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah, it seems kind of similar to that. And like when you're faced with a trade-off, it's like, yeah, what are the underlying needs and is there a way we can do both of that? But it, it's still something that's like, that's quite challenging for hard, hard for me and I imagine most people, but. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, now, okay, so now I'm hearing that uh, evaporating clouds uh -huh. might yeah. have something to do with decomposing the desires yes. uh, and breaking it apart uh, into, okay, what are the water molecules uh, that actually make up the, uh, the cloud? Yeah, I forget um, the, the reason why he used that <clears throat> metaphor for it originally, but, uh, but it, it, yeah. it is sort of like that, yes. Yeah. yeah, so very similar. And making a polarity map uh, has you, you know, looking at both ends uh, and saying, okay, what are all the positive things mm -hmm. that I like uh, about this side? And then what are the downsides? Mm -hmm. uh, and similarly, decomposing things, breaking it apart. Uh, and then you're, yeah, you're more able to ask yourself, okay, how can I get some of these upsides without some of these downsides? And are there different ways that we can behave or arrange or structure things um, such that, yeah, such that we're happier with the trade-offs that we're making? Yes, yes, right, right. I think this is something I've learned from learning about these things, but it seems like there's a few of these different kind of tools that point to the same like shift in modality of thinking. And it seems like it's really critical for all of them to like, visually surface and record what you're thinking because it gives you some distance that just like talking about it with people that you're in conflict with might not but you're right. like oh hey I didn't notice I was assuming this uh and like oh there might actually be some non-obvious solutions but if you're just kind of like back and forth uh, uh, like fighting with someone that sees it differently then you're just going to go over the same territory over and over again yep and you're going to be stuck on the inside of it Yes. rather than able to step outside and to see more. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, well, I'll definitely be interested to look that up and, and learn that more because uh, working with those kinds of trade-offs is, is, is still uh, something that's of quite interest to me. So thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah, and in one sense, it doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> yeah, There's yeah. still tension. It's still hard. <laughs> There's still intention. Uh, but at another level, it makes all the difference in the world mm. uh, to to get, as you're saying, kind of to get that distance uh, and to get that perspective uh, and to have that larger, more outside perspective uh, brings just a, a whole like dimension of freedom to mm. there, even though there's still, yeah, there's still the hard tensions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And even just not to take it personally, like, oh, this person has a need that they're really feeling. It's like, not that they're a bad person for advocating something different than I am or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That makes it easier. Um, yeah. So let's, let's talk about the, the project that you've created and intentional society. Can you just say briefly, like what it is and what you set out to do with the project? Sure. Intentional society is uh, a community for people who want to grow. Mm. So that's the simple tagline. Mm -hmm. uh, and the concept behind it is to take adult development, uh, which I've referred to, and, and um, develop mental perspective and awareness, uh, and to bring that together with relational practices, uh, such as circling, authentic relating, collective presencing, uh, and to bring those two together in kind of a theory to practice, practice to theory merger uh, within the environment of a community of relationships, of people that you know and care about and have ongoing relationship with, uh, and just see what can emerge in that kind of context. Um, I, that's, it's just kind of what I want for myself. Mm. Uh, and I want to do it with friends. Uh, and I want to, you know, I want to see what kind of, what kind of something, uh, what kind of world uh, even we can build in that spirit uh, hmm. together. But it's, um, yeah, been going for almost a year now. Uh, we're coming up soon on our one year anniversary of meeting weekly. Uh, it's a distributed community. We do Zoom calls uh, each Sunday. Um, Sunday afternoon in the in the US, uh, but we've got folks from uh, New Zealand to uh, to Europe and Africa, 
uh, and it's um, it's a wonderful, delightful, you know, in my opinion, uh, collection of of people who uh, are finding the others, uh, to use that phrase, uh, finding mm -hmm. the others who are on similar journey. Uh, journeys of self-development uh, and growth and expanding their own perspective and awareness so that we can be the people that we want to be uh, and so that we can have um, better and healthier relationships uh, and improve our, our communication and our empathy and our ability to, to relate in healthy ways. Um, and uh, then you know, following the I, we world model, like, and how would that contribute in some way to the, the overall, you know, improvement in flourishing for humanity? Mm. Um, you know, grandiose words, but everything's connected uh, mm. and fractally connected uh, in, in a sense. Uh, so we try to keep all that in mind. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and so it sounds like with this intention you do weekly video calls, what, what, what happens on your calls? What do those look like? Mm. Yeah, we, we check in uh, with each other, the, the folks that are there that week, uh, or if somebody's out that week, we'll read a little note that they send their remote check-in mm. uh, helps us stay connected mm. uh, to, uh, to people over time. But we'll check in and we'll do some connecting uh, activities. We're usually always doing a practice of some sort. Uh, and we've done quite a number of different modalities and practices and styles and variations uh, of different communication and interaction and relational practices. Uh, and sometimes we'll lean more just purely into the connection side of things. Uh, and sometimes we'll lean more into, you know, putting on the developmental lens uh, and asking ourselves, all right, what are, what am I, what am I stuck in? Uh, or what am I not seeing? Or what's my next move? What's calling to me from my circumstances, my challenge, my stressors, uh, whatever's happening to me right now? What is that calling me to step into? Uh, and what, what bigger version of myself? Uh, and so putting on that lens, uh, but doing it relationally with other people is kind of amazing because hearing from other people, like seeing yourself through other people's eyes is a really catalyzing way to gain perspective on yourself. Uh, just the, the translation loop of other people seeing you and then saying back what they're seeing in mm -hmm. you. Uh, oftentimes you're like, oh, I didn't really think about it that way. But now that you mention it, oh, I do see that aspect of what I'm going through or what I'm doing. Um, so relationship, uh, and relational interaction there. Uh, I see it as the kind of the catalyzing uh, ingredient there that can help us to, to grow and to develop and uh, to um, take perspective uh, on the challenges that we are facing. Um, yeah, doing it in community uh, with whatever kind of the wisdom traditions, when, whether it's called a, a sangha or a congregation uh, or whatever kind of community or club or whatnot, like that's, that is the wisdom of the, the ancients as well, right? Uh, do it together. So. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I heard your uh, episode with Rich where you were talking about micro solidarity and how that's influenced intentional society. And I'm curious about like the structure of these calls with respect to that, like um, right. How many people are on the call and how do you think about like the, the size variable with that? Mm, right. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, certainly this is an important factor in any group as the size and the dynamic. Uh, and I've, I've seen an awful lot of um, different orders of magnitude uh, of sizes, but uh, yeah, intentional society at the moment, like any given Sunday right now, it's probably 10 people. Uh, so we do have a lot of, um, you know, kind of a lot of coziness and flexibility uh, at that size. Uh, to use the micro solidarity, solidarity terms, we're kind of somewhere in the liminal space in between uh, a crew, which would maybe be four to six people, the sweet spot there. If you really know each, of, each person and you can go deep and you've got ultimate trust in each other. And uh, congregation 
which could be 20, 50, 100 people, uh, kind of that you know Dunbar limit sized, village sized uh, scenario where you you know everyone uh, and you can kind of relate to everyone, but it's a diff it's a qualitatively different feel there. So we're kind of in between, uh, and sometimes we're doing whole group uh, activities together and. You know, we can do certain modalities with dozen people uh, all together, uh, and it can be lovely and transcendent uh, and wonderful to kind of hold that shared space together. Uh, but a lot of times we are in breakout rooms and smaller groups, and we do a lot of work in threes and fours, pairs occasionally. Um, and um, and right now we're in a really sweet uh, space uh, for ourselves uh, that, yeah, okay, there are there may be 20 or so people who are kind of in at the moment. Uh, and there's a very high baseline of trust and comfort uh, and uh, a trust in the care and compassion that each member is bringing towards all other members. Uh, and so we can we can mix it up uh, with random small groups uh, and random breakouts, uh, and usually have a pretty pretty reliably um, you know good experience with whatever combination of of people end up in a breakout room together. Uh, but uh, yeah, we play with that uh, and different sizes, and we'll have to continue playing with that uh, as we go and uh, and as we grow and figure out how to how to maybe do all of the sizes to, you know, to refer back to, you know, polarity and holding the tensions, like there's good things at every size. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we, how do we, you know, both and that as we go? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if I, if I was hearing this correctly, when you have these meetings, uh, you know, you start with check-ins and then you have some kind of activity after that. And you said, it, it seemed like there's sort of two ends of the spectrum that one side would be more on connection and one side would be more of like a developmental type activity. Was I understanding that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it's a little mushy because it gets a little varied, you mm -hmm. know, one week we might, you know, just do a pure connection practice and then spend some time analyzing it, mm. uh, you know, or, or uh, other times we'll just do one activity uh, for, 60 70 80 minutes uh something like that that uh is really into it and yeah might lean one direction or the other on any given week uh but we spend the majority of our time you know in relationship and relating to one another um the the last major you know feature that i'll i'll add to our our general sessions on sunday is called meta time uh, and it's just a regular practice of we're always kind of trying to take that step up and back uh, and look, you know, from the balcony, so to speak, you know, on the dance floor and what we've been doing and whatever we've been dancing with that day, you know, look at it uh, and try to keep, you know, a larger perspective. And it, in, in that way, it's a practice in itself. Um, and even as I'm telling you that right now, I'm thinking like, oh yeah, and here's how we can do this better uh, <laughs> next uh, next Sunday. But um, but yeah, that's uh, a consistent feature uh, since near the beginning. Uh, and we we have other meetings and we do other sensing and steering uh, elsewhere as well. Um, but that's also an attempt to kind of um, uh, bring in an aspect of structure and governance and you know co-creation in that sense because uh, I'm I'm often very much you know kind of very strongly the facilitator or host uh, you know kind of pressing the buttons and and guiding us through uh, the uh, the agenda but um, but we want to grow as we go to having more participation and more co-creation and more leadership uh, distributed. Uh, and, you know, again, another polarity, it's not, you know, trade off of like, oh, I want to delegate or I want to give up power and hand over power to other people. No, I want to, I want to do my thing and I want other people to be maximally powerful as mm -hmm. well and to be, you know, as leaderful as they can be uh, and to create a space that's full of power and leadership uh, and where it's not, you know, that kind of zero sum, uh, you know, slicing the pie kind of uh, kind of mindset, but just is this expansive and expanding uh, culture. But um, 
Oh, now I'm, yeah, I could, I could go soapbox on that for a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part of the reason I'm curious is like, I saw on the like thing that you wrote sort of, I think it was on the document that you wrote initially sort of setting out the intention for it of uh, there being like, I think it was like five different influences. And I'm, I'm just going to read this here because people might not have seen what I'm referring to, but you said that these were sort of the different pillars or components of the influences. Um, yeah. Of, uh, there was mindfulness practices uh, such as meditation, contemplative practices, um, IFS, things like that. Then there was human connection practices like circling and authentic relating, coaching. Then there was adult development theory, Keegan, which you were talking about earlier, and some others, cultural and societal evolution, spiral dynamics, integral metamodernism, and then also future of work, self-management, sociocracy, teal, de deliberately developmental organizations. And um, that was just such an interesting set of influences. And I'm kind of getting a sense on one hand of how you combine some of those things in your meetings. Um, but also it seems like there's just a whole breadth of what it is that you're influenced by and trying to integrate that um, I'm, I'm curious how how those things fit in and, and maybe, um, you know, you've talked to some extent about the human connection practices and adult de developmental theory, but I would be curious as well to hear how, uh, you know, things like mindfulness practice, uh, cultural or societal evolution and, and the future of work fit into what you're doing there. And, you know, you can take those one by one if you want or however you'd like to answer that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll share the the map or mm. the, the the two by two mm. that I've kind of organized these these into mm. where um, where one dimension is uh, practical to theoretical uh, and the other dimension is individual to social mm. um, mm -hmm. or, or relational. And um, the um, and so four of these things, if you take future of work out. Uh, and put that kind of at the meta level. Uh, the other four pieces here kind of cover those four quadrants mm -hmm. of that two by two. Um, adult development theory is kind of the individual theoretical quadrant uh, there. How do individuals grow and develop uh, and what's our individual journey and path? Um, if you just move over to the social or collective side, of that, the theory you get, you know, into spiral dynamics uh, and, and integral and the the cultural evolution stuff out there. Um, then uh, going from the theoretical to the practical, the practice says you have the individual practices, mindfulness practices, meditative, contemplative practices, and you have the relational practices. Uh, which hearing that list, I think I've released, I've replaced human connection practices with just, just relational practices mm -hmm. as a, a, a nicer, easier term there for it. Um, but so you can lay that out uh, on the two by two and then kind of draw a bit of a circle on a diagonal and say, okay, it's the adult development stuff and the relational practices stuff where we lean in that direction. We lean more relational than individual. And we lean more practical than theoretical. Mm. Although the theory is is good, and you want to you know stay aware of it, but um, that's the the distribution of emphasis mm. uh, on that map that um, that has really emerged and come out came come out itself from intentional society. Uh, that that list that I wrote a year ago was like, all right, here's all this stuff. And as you say, it's like quite a wide variety of different things in there. And yeah, now I think we, we focus less on cultural evolution uh, and we're not, um, you know, we're not an accountability buddy group for individual practices mm -hmm. so much, uh, but, um, but instead personal development and relational practice and putting those together. And that's kind of where the sweet spot is. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's then the maybe the unique flavor of 
intentional society as a community and is kind of the answer to the question of well, like why even start a new thing in the first place mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. why why try why do this thing and you know try to get something off the ground rather than joining any number of of other existing groups but uh but yeah so that's the that's the strength and the the focus there and and future of work yeah i could you know i could totally be a a, a geek out uh, i could geek out all day you know about different like governance models and decision making theories and structures and uh how to orient all those things but um we generally um we generally try not to uh mm. geek out about that in intentional society and um stick with uh what i call just in time structure uh and just notice again practicing awareness and noticing to notice what we need and put something in place you know when we when we see it uh and when we see the need for it mm-hmm. uh but um but yeah kind of staying light and lean on that and avoiding the what i think is a trap to like try to make like big long rule sets mm-hmm. you know or guidebooks uh that you know predetermined like okay here's how we operate and um just putting it in all in in stone just wouldn't be productive at all for us yeah that makes sense that makes sense I, I can see with that two by two how how you're kind of hitting a, a a different set of needs and goals than other structures might like uh, you know for example like oh there's definitely an interest in say mindfulness there as you said but it but it's not like you're trying to create like a, a meditation community or something like that or you know on the other hand it, it certainly overlaps with the future of work of what you're saying as you're saying but it's not like you're trying to create a company either or um you know a structure like that or be someone's boss or uh something like that so it's sort of adjacent to a lot of things but uh you'd really need a different kind of structure to meet the specific needs that you're really trying to uh serve for people so yeah that's really cool that that two by two really gave me a good sense of what you're up to mm, um cool yeah um i wonder like you were saying it, it's almost been a year since you started it and w- what would you say you've learned since you did create it like what what are some of the things that like lessons that you've learned about about the group or or what you're trying to do or you know just organizing things in general anything like that that you've learned over the last year i'd, I'd love to hear about that <laughs> hmm yeah uh and there's i don't know this is an somehow there's there's a bit of a catch to this like it's an interestingly hard question Mm. for me um not that it's a surprising one it's a very obvious like oh well what have you learned Mm -hmm. um but um yeah for me i've been i think i've been in some fairly subtle spaces sometimes for me uh at least uh some of my learning has to do with leadership Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm obviously in a very kind of like hub role uh, in this community. I'm I'm the person that the most people know, and I'm the founder of this thing. So, uh, um, kind of the hub in the hub and spoke uh, right now. But um, my relationship to leadership uh, and to how I show up, you know, wearing those hats or in that role that has been an area of kind of continuous uh and fairly rich learning for me um i'm i'd say at this point i'm kind of stepping back more into um what i want to kind of call a post egalitarian stance Mm. um regarding leadership there's well real quickly there's there's the uh, conventional hierarchy uh-huh. of companies and you know American business world and bosses and you know authoritarianism essentially yes. uh, and so we reject that and we move on to like oh that is so uh, abusive and icky and yuck all right we're all gonna we're all gonna sit in a circle together and everybody's gonna be equal Uh, And that's the next phase, you know, of, okay, equality and egalitarianism. And that is wonderful and lovely. And um, 
a, it's a great set of values there. But then you can also end up in a situation where like nobody feels like they can make any decisions mm -hmm. uh, and everything has to be done by consensus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it can feel like uh, quicksand sometimes where, you know, you've sort of released the structure, but then haven't replaced it with anything. Uh, and so the values are good, but the execution there uh, can be lacking. And, you know, there's a, there's a phrase that, Tyrann, the tyranny of structurelessness uh, that kind of tries to describe this trap of some of these things that were that were reified in the authoritarian hierarchy uh, are still there in the egalitarian circle. Mm. They're just invisible. Mm. You know, and sometimes we when we when we kind of reject all of that, well, there are still power dynamics in any group. There are still different levels of influence that different people have in any social community or social circle. Uh, and so you can't, you know, there's, this is kind of a, on the other hand, you know, you can't just wish those things away and pretend that they don't exist. And if you try to pretend that they don't exist, they just end up being a stronger shadow mm -hmm. uh, that controls you because you can't even talk about it because you're mm -hmm. pretending that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and so moving into that post egalitarian space uh, as a leader and with my relationship towards leadership uh, and our relationship as a group too uh, is you know is really interesting fertile ground it's not one that i've had a whole lot of experience with or that a lot of people i think have much experience with in many of our conventional organizations or scenarios um, so it, yeah, it gets back to that like kind of like maximally everyone maximally powerful kind of question. Uh, how can I embody and embrace and be the leader that I am uh, in this community, while also creating more space for other people to be leaders too? Uh, and how do we do this in a way that you know, okay, I recognize the authority that I have as the, you know, initial caller, the holder of the vision, the keeper of the flame, whatever uh, the metaphor. How do I recognize my authority and disconnect that from being authoritarian, you know, with or about that authority? So teasing some of those things apart, um, again, defusing, uh, you know, some of like my trauma, you know, even just coming from just a typical corporate background, uh, but just the, the, the level of authoritarianism in the water there uh, and saying like, oh, no, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to be like that. Mm. I, I don't want to control people. I don't want to give people orders. I don't want to tell people what to do. Um, but, you know, figuring out like, oh, well, but what are we doing together? And how do we have a direction? And how do we make any decisions? Uh, and so finding that line, decomposing the different pieces of that uh, and figuring out how to embody uh, healthy leadership uh, that, um, yeah, has, you know, kind of integrates uh, or to borrow the integral phrase, like transcend and include, mm. uh, that transcends and includes the good parts of these different stages of leadership and organizational uh, approaches, but uh, synthesizes them in a way that can integrate more, integrate the polarity uh, mm. to a greater degree. Mm. That makes me curious about where you see intentional society going in the future, like maybe in the next year or coming years, like what, what, what you see being on the horizon. Yeah. Oh man, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And mm -hmm. that's all, kind of, that's always my first answer uh, is that um, because that's another um, I guess that's another learning that I'll, I'll throw out there is, you know, kind of relating to planning. Uh, it is, it is neither the um, big upfront planning and do your yearly planning or your quarterly, you know, roadmap out for the next five quarters. Uh, it's not that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also not, mm, let's just feel into the present moment. Mm -hmm. Where is the present moment taking us? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, you know, in that purely moment by moment uh, approach either. There's some 
great things to find there of oh, what's alive, where's the energy, where are we being pulled? Um, but the, the metaphor that I use is kind of like trying to, uh, you've, you've got a hand on the tiller of a boat, you know, and you're kind of steering the boat uh, and you're feeling the, the wind, uh, you know, on the sails and the waves and currents, you know, around you. And you, you have a kind of a direction, uh, but, you know, you may need to tack, uh, you may need to work with the wind as it shifts and changes. Uh, and so it's not, um, you know, it's not a fixed rigid plan, uh, nor is it drifting either, uh, but it's kind of steering in a direction and, you know, adjusting the tiller. And, and I want my hand on that, you know, tiller is the right word, right? I'm, I'm, I think so. Hope I'm hope I'm using the right boating word. Uh -huh. um, you know, hand on that piece of wood that is connected to the rudder. Um, but I want other people's hands on that too, and and I want us to. Oh, it's almost like uh, this is new to me. This just flashed. You know, like it's almost like a Ouija board. Mm. Uh, if you like, people. I think you know, multiple people put their hand on the thing, and it like floats around, and it's like, okay, people are pulling and tugging on it. Um, so there's kind of that subtlety of like group steering mm -hmm. there of mm -hmm. us sensing into our direction and the direction that we're heading uh but there's there's also kind of like a yeah all right there is a far horizon out there and i don't know maybe we'll sail straight for 10 years and go there or uh, we'll probably take all sorts of zigzags uh around and might not even end up there at all might end up someplace we don't even see mm -hmm. uh right now so i don't know that's probably there's my overly elaborate preamble, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think, to, to talking or speculating about the future. Mm -hmm. But given all of those, um, I don't know, I guess caveats uh, and kind of trying to frame it as like, you know, I'm not holding tightly to mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know, even, even right now, even today, and, you know, the next Sunday, this week that we're meeting, like I'm working, you know, or I, I should say, this is working me over actually being able to be more free and be clear about what I want and what I see and what I forecast uh, and being able to trust the whole community there that they can hear that mm. and they can handle that and that they can hold that and at the same time, hold their own visions mm -hmm. and their own desires their own wants and needs. Um, I, you know, this is just my learning from a couple days ago of like realizing that, oh, there's something in me that has been holding back, like not wanting to overpower people, not wanting to dominate, not wanting to like, you know, do too much or, you know, cram down other people by being big and free with all of the visions and designs uh, that, um, that I can think of. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so you're seeing me process this here in real time, uh, now. And, um, cause yeah, I plan to share some of this, this Sunday. Um, but, uh, but yeah, being able to, being able to trust folks, uh, that, um, that I'm not too much, that I'm not too big. Um, cause I think, I mean, the feedback that I've heard lately is like, yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear more. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think? What do you want? What we, we'd, we'd love to, you know, and so I think, um, yeah, I think that's going to maybe unlock, uh, some things for us. Uh, cause I thinking through it psychologically, I could, you know, I could guess that if I'm holding back on, you know, what I, you know, on what I want, then probably other people are too, mm -hmm. you know, that they're sensing that they're picking that up. Uh, people are people are finely tuned and sensitive, mm -hmm. um, even unconsciously, uh, and that you know yeah maybe we can unlock our desires a bit more and then just get into that generative building growing space of combining uh, and yes anding uh, and brainstorming and combining and and yeah I can I can get real excited uh, mm -hmm. about that but. But gosh, I noticed I still haven't like actually launched into the main answer to mm. the question, right? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. So I don't have I don't have a big, coherent, cohesive picture to share. Mm. 
but maybe I can share some desires and just mm -hmm. some things that I want. Mm -hmm. uh, cause I do know a bunch of those. Great. I know that I know that I want, um, I know that I want intentional society to be a place where people, where, where members can step into leadership and co-creation and greater ownership of this shared space, uh, especially just even over the next year or so. Uh, I want the trajectory to continue of, hey, I put out this vision and I, you know, the, the call was my vision initially and I want it to evolve towards more of a shared community vision, um, you know, which uh, I, I I guess probably relates to that like me holding back thing too mm. of like oh okay i want more pe you know more vision from more people and more leadership more ownership to step up and step forward but um um that's probably like oh actually me stepping into that at the same time anyways sorry real-time processing no problem, no problem. <laughs> um but uh so i want uh, i want more people to be uh leading more uh in intentional society a year from now uh, I want us to have more of a governance structure. Uh, and by that, I specifically, I think, mean decision-making structure that is bigger than me uh, and is more, uh, I'll say, grooved into our practices, grooved into our culture and the way that we do things uh, and that we can understand you know, how we make various decisions of different sizes uh, and get into a, into a groove, so to speak, on that. Uh, I do want us to grow. Uh, and this is, I, I'm very careful when I say this, uh, because, well, from Goodhart's law of, you know, every metric becoming a, a poor measurement, if you actually, you know, try to push on the metric, on mm -hmm. the measurement, instead of the actual thing that you care about, becomes disconnected from reality. But um, even just beyond that, there's so much about growth and sizes and importance and power around that that like oof no i'm not looking for growth for its own sake it's not the end result it can't be like it 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 fails if you put that on the pedestal then it becomes the idol and mm -hmm. the corrupting idol and you and you know you lose everything i think uh, and I've you know, seen situations of that. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I, am, I, have, I have a positive intention toward growth. Uh, I think it's some of the challenge of, hey, how can we figure out, uh, is this some special unique snowflake that is just this combination that we don't know how we're doing, what we're doing? Because I think we're doing an amazing thing. Uh, and I, I come out of each Sunday going like, wow. Uh, and feeling energized, uh, and that, yeah, I, like I, I don't know what, um, like I, like I can't not do this. Uh, like this is amazing. This is important, um, and I think that is, I think that's shared by a, a, the the whole core community here. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I want to. I want to be intentional and aware about the challenges of growth. Uh, and I do want to invite growth and that needs to be steady. That needs to be measured. That needs to be not super crazy uh, peaks uh, and valleys to that. But, um, but yeah, trying to figure things out at different scale and trying to uh, just the the joy, um, almost the, the, the meta like joy of may, may all beings uh be peaceful and happy and their best selves and so how do we if if we've got we've got this amazing thing that we love doing together and it benefits us so much like how do we you know unlock this for for more people or how do we how do we make space uh to share that with more people and i'd love to share well-being and thriving with yeah who who wouldn't I want to share that with? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that there's that good, you know, um, motivation and you know compassion to that. Uh, but at the same time, that's you know there's there's a lot of of challenges and problems and difficulties and changes and um, and it can be really hard to navigate change and growth uh, specifically. 
And so that's something to be super aware of and cognizant of and to be, you know, holding that as an object continually uh, and not getting swept up or lost inside of it. Um, but, um, but yeah, to be able to be aware of it and intentional about it. Uh, so yeah, so that was my long caveat about, mm. uh, you know, the disclaimers around growth uh, and the, the polarity-ish, um, you know, aspects of there are good things in growth and there are good things in, in large groups, but there are also good things in small groups. And we really, really don't want to lose mm-hmm. those good things in small groups. Um, and is that, is that a polarity that is totally integratable? Eh, it's not the kind of problem that you can just solve and be done with. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's something that we're going to have to hold. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so, but I look forward to doing that and I look forward to growing it and I look forward to handling those challenges and processing that with the entire community. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we'll lead, you know, we'll, we'll lead with what we want for ourselves and each, each step, um, you know, everything that we're doing now is what is right for us to be doing right now and Mm -hmm. makes sense for us right now. And there is no step on some, you know, hypothetical path of growth uh, that is just a way station of like, oh, our desire is to get, you know, a million people and take over the world. Uh, well, if if that's what you're focusing on, then you're going to neglect where you are right here, right now, uh, or some other future step. <laughs> no step, um, what is it, Gaul's Law, uh, that uh, every complex system evolved from uh, a less complex system that was already working. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, th- I think that's a very true law of complex systems, which almost any human group or org is a complex system like that, uh, that they have to be grown uh, and gardened, tended organically and nurtured uh, in order to, to, to grow and flourish and expand and thrive like that. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like you want to keep serving your community in the ways that you currently are True. while becoming more robust as a group that's able, able to make stronger decisions collectively mm-hmm. and distribute power and then mm-hmm. also ultimately give those same benefits to more people without losing any of that. Yes, I feel heard. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not not easy, but it sounds like you're steering in that direction and doing what you can to go there I, uh, and not rushing either. So that's good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's maybe that's another learning I'll mention uh, is just how long and short a year is. Mm. Uh, and where did I think we'd be a year in? I don't know. Uh, but I can see now why we are exactly where we are. Mm. Uh, over the last year, and I see the time that it takes to build relationships and to grow trust. And I don't think that's something that can just be skipped or jumped uh, or or decided by our conscious minds, even like, okay, I'm just going to decide that I'm going to trust you. Like, nah, it doesn't really, like, even if we try to do that to ourselves, like the rest of ourself doesn't really cooperate with that. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, certain things are slow uh, or feel slow, um, maybe to some people, not others. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, are a, are a gradual, long process of maturation uh, and development as a group. And yeah, it's interesting to look at, say, the, the culture, say just the culture of uh, vulnerability. Let's take uh, how vulnerable uh, are people, you know, with their weaknesses or fears or just sharing, uh, you know, without, without fear uh, in the group setting. Well, there's something in the air or something in the water. There's something in the culture that we've built uh, that I think affects people at an, in kind of the, the unconscious way, the, 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 the intuitive social cues that we pick up. When a new person comes into the group right now, uh, it seems like they absorb 
unconsciously from the the norms and the the you'd say you could say vibes uh you know and the and the trust that exists between the other group members and they can slip into that and step into that and there's a there's a much faster train like it doesn't take the same like uh you know x you know four six eight month you know growth period for that person to feel totally comfortable within a few weeks they seem like they've you know really dropped in mm -hmm. uh to the culture uh and are participating and so there's something there that is i mean it's it's completely a figment of our imaginations right on the one hand it's just uh it's just a construct it's just our attitudes it's just how we hold ourselves it's just the vibe mm. um but on the other hand it's something that's real and something that has taken a long time to construct and mature and tune as we've gone throughout this entire year uh it's it's i've sort of seen it and watched it evolve over the entire year slowly slowly inch by inch growing and um and becoming more solid um it's still a construct but growing more solid in our minds and well i'll say in our bodies mm -hmm. you know in our embodied whole selves uh that we can trust in this and lean into this and that's where you yeah that's where you you really start to get metaphors of like you can trust the space or the space will hold it uh kind of language there uh because there really is it it feels like something there you know that that hammock uh underneath us supporting us mm. Mm. yeah it's really beautiful and inspiring to hear about what you're up to and kind of how it's grown and what you see coming in the future and uh yeah i, I uh it's been interesting to learn about it and, and hear about what you've been up to um is there anything that you'd like to say more about or talk more about uh that's related to anything that we've talked about hmm um no i don't i don't have any like agenda talking points that i need mm. to to whip out mm -hmm. um but uh uh but i am you know as far as like being here and talking with you uh mm. and you know your experience with and connections with um monastic academy mm -hmm. um i i look to i look to that organization and i think like oh what a great ally potential ally mm. in the meta network or mm. or web of aligned groups i i feel a lot of alignment uh with what maple uh and and willow uh and uh and people uh across that um org are are doing and so i don't know i'd i'd, I'd really be interested in exploring you know what you've been i don't know i guess what what reactions bubble up for you um having been in that world and now hearing a bit about my world mm. uh so to speak that i'm mm -hmm. incubating over here and what sort of connections uh do you see and um and and i see and that like that would be really interesting mm -hmm. to me to talk about yeah yeah i think it was uh this conversation has has reminded me of how powerful circling in particular has been for me that's a practice that's used there and that i was exposed to there and have done a lot mm. of there and um mm -hmm. i feel like circling helped me to make certain you know you might say developmental shifts uh sort of accelerated that for me and uh i think that that is a valuable addition to a monastic environment certainly i think that was a pretty interesting innovation that they came up with there and uh you know i think there's some maybe problems with circling or uh challenges with how to do it well and uh i might do it differently myself uh than the way that i was taught it there or practiced it there but uh hmm. but overall i think it it was just such a powerful sort of social technology and uh shifted things for me personally and i think um you know i haven't yeah. done too much circling outside of the uh container there i have done a little bit but not too much and I, it seems to me from what i can tell that one of the unique things about circling there is that 
people have, well, there's two things. One is people have a meditation practice. Um, so they have various skills that are cultivated by having a contemplative practice. And, and that, that's sort of uh, ubiquitous. It's not just like one or two or three or four people, but everyone has a practice of some kind. And then also, um, you know, you're circling with people that you know, that you even live with and work with. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that that does make things different if you know the people really well. So so well that, you know, they, they sleep near you or, you know, you <laughs> meditate next to them or you're working with them on this project or whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, that comes to mind being grateful for the circling that I've done and uh, how power that, powerful that was for me developmentally. And um, yeah, I think that's, this conversation has reminded me of that. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and thank you, by the way, for your, uh, what is circling blog mm. post mm -hmm. started using that as my go-to reference to hand out. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. I, I like to, I've said this elsewhere, but I like to write the things that I would have wanted to read when I got interested in certain things. And uh, there seemed to be a dearth of good material, just like straightforward. What, what is this thing? So yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I'd be curious to hear about like what the sort of style of circling is that you do when you do practice sort of the more connection type things, like how you frame that and how, how you practice it there. And so it, it does seem like different, sort of communities have different um, like sort of sourdough cultures of how, of how they do it and what it feels like. And be curious to hear you describe what that's like for the intentional society community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, and yeah, the, the thing I resonate with you, you know, talking about, um, you know, circling <clears throat> monastic academy is that you, that you know the people and that you are in relationship ongoing with mm -hmm. those people that you are circling with, uh, which, uh, which I find to be a really, um, I don't know, important and meaningful distinction for me. Um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of practice groups uh, out there, you know, circling in AR uh, groups uh, across, across this country and many cities um, at least. And, um, but a lot of them, I've experienced, you know, or I've had a fair amount of ex experience with kind of just the drop-in style mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, it's a group of strangers. Uh, we, you know, okay, I've, I've never met you all before, but all right, we're going to drop in, we're going to follow these simple rules, we're going to connect with each other. And in one sense, I think it's almost easier to do that. It's easier when the risk is lower, if you're never going to see these people again. Or if you have no connection to these people, like you can bare your soul and be, you know, vulnerable. And like, even if it goes badly, well, then I don't know, you, you walk away at the end of the night, you know, and, uh, and that's over. But, um, but yeah, circling with people that you have ongoing relationships with, I think that, um, I mean, to me, yeah, the, you, you mentioned, you know, some of the, the critiques uh, or problems that, you know, circling can have, uh, certainly. And um, I think that's, I think that's an important difference, you know, between, you know, kind of, um, kind of the simulation critique of like, oh, well, we're just, we're just faking connection and it, but it doesn't really mean anything uh, is, is one of the criticisms uh, of circling. And um but it, if you actually genuinely care about the other person and you know them and you have a relationship with them, then uh, I don't know, I think it dissolves a lot of that for mm -hmm. me uh, and feels meaningful uh, in a way that the drop-in groups kind of don't, um, other than to the extent that you do, you get to know people, you know, as you interact with them. And certainly there's, there's something real there about that. I'm, I'm never going to call a circle totally fake mm -hmm. um, for, for myself, but um, anyway, the texture, um, yeah, the texture and the style vibe of uh, intentional society circling. Uh, we did three weeks recently in the, the last months. Uh, we did a little three week series of, um, birthday circling, organic circling, and topical circling mm. uh, over a, a three-week period, kind of different style each week. Um, and I would say, hmm, how to describe the house style or vibe? Uh, I'd say that there's a, I'd say that there's a deep base of compassion 
underlying the the spirit of the circle. Um, so there's, mm, I don't know, but in in some other circles, in other places, uh, that that aspect to me has felt more just pure neutral mm. to me of like, oh, okay, you're a person. I can take you or leave you, but you're just another person. Um, and um, and that feels that, that it, there's definitely a qualitative feeling difference for me inside of intentional society. Like we have this trust and these relationships. And so there's something that that brings to circling. Um, even if we've you know, never done it before, or done this style before or, or whatever, um, there's, there's that just reality uh, underlying the circle there. Uh, and so I think um, there's kind of the, there's kind of the radical candor challenge to, uh, to, to circling, you know, you want to be curious about what it is, uh, like what's going on inside another person's, you know, mind, or what's it like to be them, what's it like to be in their world. Uh, so there's this curiosity and this, you know, kind of pulling dimension of almost going after uh, sometimes, you know, in, in a, in an aggressive type of, so you can feel like, oh, people are going after you almost. Um, but there's um, there's a gentleness that um, that I feel in intentional society, even as we like, we, we did pretty well. I would rate us pretty highly on the asking questions and not being shy or not being afraid to ask questions. Because, so, you know, there's kind of the two, so there's like, describing your internal state there's noticing and naming you know on yourself and that's you know less threatening you know in the abstract of like okay i'm not even saying anything about you i'm just going to like describe something about myself and that's the unassailable truth because that's my experience right so that's kind of the safer uh, you know half of the practice um, but i think we i think we did a great job of um investigating and asking and being curious uh, about the circle e uh, without that feeling without that feeling anything like a, a like a pursuit uh, or um, uh, witch hunt is too strong uh, but um, uh, but without you know being super close to that edge for that person of like ooh, is th this can the person trust, can the circle trust in the safety of the circle and of the questions and of the interrogation? Like, can they, can they still trust uh, that it is a safe place uh, and that they can, yeah, you know, that they can then accurately and safely and truthfully, like, yeah, just, you know, enter into and describe their own internal state and experience and explore the wonderful juicy things that are there to, to explore um, without some of the, um, without some of the defensiveness or defensive edges. Uh, and even as I say that, I wanna say like, okay, well, sometimes that can be fruitful, like to work with defensive edges in a circle. And that can be amazing too. And I don't wanna like knock that or downplay that. Uh, but yeah, house style in terms of intentional society uh, is, yeah, kind of that gentle, loving vibe underneath things. And so, um, yeah, describing experience, uh, very few hesitations, asking questions, uh, and exploring another's world uh, also seemed fairly free to me. And uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's what I'll maybe highlight as what might be the flavor, the unique flavor here. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. It's sort of cool to compare notes about these things. And uh, I'm remembering that um, before I left Maple, there were three or four opportunities that I had to lead some small circles and, you know, three, four, five, six people. And I was exploring a specific style of circling that like I was trying to create that I was basically trying to create the kind of circling that I wanted that was a okay. bit different than what I was seeing and um I was 
I think there are a few things that I did, if I can recall correctly, but I think I started with like leading basically like a guided meditation and, uh, you know, sort of coming into presence with oneself in various ways and then uh, becoming aware of the other people. And uh, I think usually I would have some kind of like guidance about like recalling that other people have their own experience and like they're coming into this in their own place and uh, they might not be where you are and they also like mean well and want to be connected and kind of like uh, priming the pump for theory of mind sort of it's like mm-hmm. oh yeah these people have different experiences uh, right, right. and then um, and then leading with check-in having everyone check in where they were and uh so I think it can be really jarring to come into a circle and be like, oh, I had no idea that this person just had like a really difficult phone call or didn't right. sleep much last night or, or whatever it is, um, or they're really happy today for whatever reason. And then and then it would sort of shift into an organic circle, but uh, there would be kind of a, a guardrail of, um, yeah, this is something we talked a lot about in the last year that I was there about like the relationship between circling and Buddhist right speech and uh, like circling could be a container to practice right speech. And so I would uh, sort of put up a guardrail of like, let's be sure to have, uh, you know, there's different qualities of right speech, but like let's practice in particular kind speech and uh, not say things that are cruel or or mean and like uh, try to focus on having kind speech. And, and you would be the judge of your own speech and whether it was kind or not, but like, let's have that be a collective intention to constrain ourselves to uh kind speech and that seemed to that those sort of different variables seem to create something that had the like depth and vulnerability that circling usually does with a kind of more of a psychological safety and like shared understanding than uh that at least that i was experiencing in other circles especially like big there's this style of like surrendered leadership circles and sometimes those are like huge and i think it's really hard to have like it's really easy to get sort of depth and uh like deep insight into what it's like to be someone else in a surrendered leadership circle but it's like harder to have psychological safety i think and uh mm. and connection and intimacy so just trying to like balance those two things with that those experiments yeah so did it did it work how, or how how did it work and uh is that close to kind of your vision for what you'd, you'd love circling to be or is there any other parts that you would add to your vision of the perfect circle <laughs> yeah i think it worked really well it was uh they tended to be quite intimate and like i was noticing preceding it that like i at least left a lot of circles like being like really frustrated and uh like feeling disconnected from other people and like sometimes like hurt or 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 that i'd said something hurtful and it was like i just i don't ever want to participate in a circle again where like i leave like that i want to mm. be um leaving feeling like i acted appropriately other people acted appropriately i don't want to be getting hurt or hurt it uh, like hurting someone else and um and so it sort of created a more intimate, kind container of, of connection that I, I don't think it sacrificed like uh, the kind of depth that's possible of like being curious about someone else's experience and learning about it. It was just like creating a safe container. And um, mm-hmm. I think I think maybe uh, something I would do, I think I did some of this, but would love to do more of is like do circling that has like specifically meta at the beginning of a guided meditation of like, mm. let's come into a, a metaphor, loving kindness, heart space, and then circle from there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Meta and kindness in particular, I'm, I'm kind of interested. Um, how would you, how would you kind of find the balance there of, you know, if, when you say kindness, um, say I have a, say I have a thought, you know, I notice that I'm having a thought or a story that, you know, is maybe not very nice mm-hmm. uh, or could be, you know, uh, where's the, you know, how would, how would you illustrate that uh, mm-hmm. for us of how do you, how do you stay kind and honest mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. about that? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot there. I mean, um, 
truth is an important part of right speech as well, accuracy. I think our culture, we tend to overemphasize accuracy, that we equate truth with accuracy, but in, in Buddhism, something that is true is both kind and useful and, and accurate. It, it's accurate and useful, beneficial. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this, the five qualities of right speech are something that's accurate, something that's useful or beneficial, something that has kind words, that the words are kind, that the state of mind that you speak it from is kind, and that uh, it's timely. So you could have something that's all of those things, but said at the wrong time or in the wrong context or the wrong way. And um, it's e I think it's easier to work with kind words to start than kind state of mind. Uh, but that's, that's also a goal. And um, I think it's important to say as well that like in this framing, if you were using it, it would be a voluntary practice that you were trying to hold yourself to. And it's not like, I think it would be inappropriate to police someone else and be like, oh, that was unkind of you, you know, and be like, you were wrong. Uh, it's like, no, like, let's set the mutual intention to right. practice being kind. Um, and then I'd also say, um, you know, that being kind is not the same thing as being nice. So, uh, you know, there, there's true and useful things you can say that are kind that might feel uncomfortable to say or might feel uncomfortable to hear, yeah. but people can feel if it's coming from a kind intention from a kind state of mind, if your intention is good. And when I was doing this, I would sort of actively hold the question of like, how it is sort of like the polarities you're talking about, like, how can I be honest and kind now? Uh, yeah. and, and usually there was a way to do it. There was a way to sort of toe the line and uh, <clears throat> people were able to do that pretty consistently, especially if you set that up as like, hey, this is a frame, we're going to try and be kind here and you, you get to decide what's kind for you but um you know so for example saying like oh when you said that i felt angry that's not unkind that's you know it might yeah. be uncomfortable uh or like oh i had a, a mean thought in my head that's also not unkind that's that's honest right. and, and and connecting and could be useful in a certain way so it's more about how you present yourself and show up and then then oh never being uncomfortable or something like that or never saying something that's challenging and um, that's mm -hmm. why I think it doesn't sacrifice the sort of like truth seeking quality of circling or like curiosity about others experience, because it's not like, oh, you're just saying nice things to each other. Uh, that's a valuable practice too, but that's, it's not the same as that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah I like it. And, uh, yeah, very definitely, uh, kindness and niceness can be very different things. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. I think circling is a really good a good place to explore that and uh, find out how it's possible to say kind things and not say cruel things and mm -hmm. uh, at least it's it certainly was for me that was one of the key benefits I got out of it was it really it, it was for me I, I intentionally took out the practice of practicing right speech in circling and uh, that's been mm -hmm. that's been very helpful for me mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah and just the the precision that it encourages about mm -hmm. ownership mm -hmm. uh, and notice you know recognizing what is yours and your own experience versus what we project onto others often mm -hmm. like I think that's yeah one of um, circling and several other kind of relating modalities um, you know greatest strengths uh, is just helping us to become aware of how how often we lose the map between, you know, our model of everyone and everything in our head that is what we are working with and the real them mm -hmm. out there uh, and how much we project uh, our own interpretations and our own judgments uh, onto people and onto other things that are really just experiences that we are creating for ourselves in our heads. Um, and I love the way that that circling can sometimes point that out to us and illustrate how different the stories that we <laughs> instantly unconsciously construct can be so different from the lived experience of the other person that that we're constructing them about. Mm, absolutely. I, yeah, one of the questions I was thinking of asking you, which, which I'd be curious to hear what you'd say is like, what in your experience makes a good circle? And, and it reminds me that like, for me, one of the 
things that makes a really good circle is when I'm like come into contact with someone else's experience in such a way that I'm just like totally surprised like oh wow I had no idea it was like that for you and and now I know and it, like it just changes my experience of another person or people in general and it, it, being exposed to some different aspect of of social reality that I was just completely surprised by like that that makes for a really good circle for me mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah well for me I, I mean I think I'll grab uh your your word kindness mm. uh and um and smush it together with what did I say compassion maybe mm. Um, as the cultural base uh, in intentional society, uh, bringing that towards circling. And I think, yeah, I think that I'm going to, I'm going to run with that. It's like, oh, I think that's a good, uh, important ingredient uh, Mm -hmm. of a good circle. Uh, I've, I've rarely run into a circle that has felt noticeably unkind. It's happened to me a few times. Um, but, uh, but still just the quality difference between kind of a, a neutral, uh, valence there and, a, a real base of say kindness. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that, yeah, creates a much more fertile, rich ground, uh, to, um, to do the work, mm-hmm. uh, to do one's own work, mm-hmm. uh, in, uh, in a circle, um, the other thing that comes to mind of what makes a good circle uh, is the thing that I really relish the most uh, is that um, is kind of that moment of when I, I'm going to, I describe something uh, or I share, I share something and, you know, somebody says, well, uh, hearing, hearing that um, and there's the, well, there's, there's two, well, there's two, both two good things uh, here that, that happen. Well, you know, one, um, a person might, you know, share what they've heard uh, and kind of just reflect uh, what they've heard uh, me share and the kind of different angle, you know, that bounces off another person and comes back to me like that's, that's interesting. But um, even more, um, the, the, um, even more when that person says, hearing that, I feel, you know, and describes the impact, you know, and how that, how that floated over and landed in their, you know, emotional landscape and their world and what it interacted with uh, and how that, you know, what trickle, what effects uh, it had inside of them. Um, That is, to me, the magical moment of, connection of oh i'm hearing i'm hearing more about this person and i'm hearing what their what their landscape is like and what the texture uh, of their inner life is like uh but i'm hearing it in a way that like it's this interaction with like this probe from me like this share from me this probe kind of floated over and i'm hearing about the interaction of my world and their world Mm. Uh, and hearing that interaction of worlds, uh, I think is kind of the juiciest or tingliest, um, (laughs) you know, kind of moment for me that, uh, that I relish in circling. Mm. Definitely. Definitely. That reminds me of like, uh, It seems like in some circles, especially small circles, I I haven't really experienced this in huge circles, but that it's possible to have like shared understanding or experience of what's happening in a way that's, it's tricky to describe, but it's sort of like collective consciousness type experiences where like you like know that this person is experiencing this thing and like they know that you know and like certain things become possible that are like nonverbal or um and it's it's like distributed not just between one or two people but three or four or five maybe not more than that uh and uh those have always that's you know that's like a rare experience but that's always been very profound for me to be um that's why I like one-on-one conversations so much because it's like highly possible to have kind of a shared uh collective experience in between two people um, right 
but with more than that it's like harder but also even more it's like really rewarding when it's like three or four or five people were like yes like this is happening and it, it's tricky to describe but uh very very profound to experience that mm -hmm. absolutely yeah i i want to i resonate in mm -hmm. recognition mm -hmm. of that uh collective consciousness uh yes. experience that you describe and yeah, and in, I mean, I guess in some ways it can be the same as like, yeah, you're talking one on one with a good friend and you're really on the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. You get on the same wavelength and you drop in and you're finishing each other's sentences and you're just like so in tune and you're so excited about whatever you're talking about. And yeah, <laughs> uh, that there's there's that. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, that that sort of similar like same wavelength kind mm -hmm. of feel uh, with more people is um, yeah, it's it's it is really hard to describe. Uh, I'll agree with you there. Uh, and there's something really profound, at least really profound seeming. That's my experience of it. Um, and uh, and I think it. I don't know. I think I've I think I've felt the same kind of thing even in some larger groups. Mm -hmm. This was surprising and interesting to me. So uh, I'll share that. Um, um, doing collective presencing. Uh, this is um, this is another. It's a group uh, group interaction modality developed by uh, Ria Back, mm -hmm. uh, and you can find collectivepresencing.com. And there's a whole book on it. Uh, but um, in larger groups of you know, okay, there are a dozen people or 15 people there, uh, but there's sort of explicitly held sort of a, a center of the circle and and sort of people are are tenderly reaching out and interacting with the thing the living thing in the center of the circle and um it um yeah i i think i've ex had the same kind of feel and the same kind of experience more less maybe less like oh i really feel like i'm in tune with all 15 people here and more like oh i feel like i'm in tune with this shared center Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the circle uh, but but it was a wow kind of like blow my mind kind of experience for me because i you know i wouldn't have said that that mm -hmm. would be possible you know in a large group like mm -hmm. that but um mm -hmm. but yeah there's something there's something about the the you know, flavor qualia uh of that um of that unified or collective consciousness type of of experience that uh yeah, it's just so unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty special. Yeah, I would completely agree. I, I I think it's definitely possible in large groups, but like, uh, like there can be shared understanding and shared connection. It's just like one. I think it's harder to have it be as deep or like, yep. uh, like as much like bandwidth of understanding about each individual person. And then mm -hmm. also it's really easy to leave out individuals. Like there's often, it seems yeah. like, say there's a group of 12 people. It seems like there's often like two or three that are like not being into what's being discussed or not right, as connected. Right. And then there's six, they're like, oh yeah, this is great. We're totally vibing. This is on the same level. And um, there's sort of like patches of, of things missing or a disconnection. And uh, so yeah. it's not that that kind of experience isn't possible in my experience. It's just, it seems to be either not as deep or not as, like well distributed, but at five or lower, it seems like you can have it be like a hundred percent evenly distributed and like mm -hmm. lots of depth of shared understanding as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, maybe there's a useful distinction there between a shared uh, experience and a fully shared mm. uh, experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's also making me reframe like something I wanted to say earlier, I was talking about the practice of Buddhist right speech. And like, I learned that in a Buddhist context, it's a Buddhist practice that I practiced in a monastery, but like, I, I would just want to make explicit that that's like something anyone could pick up, even if they're not a Buddhist or not in a monastery, because like, if you have a mouth that can speak, you might be interested in like how to do that well in a way that's like useful and, and not hurtful to other people. Most people care about ethics. And it's it's like a specific framework for how to speak that you can practice yourself on your own in any context. And mm -hmm. uh, so I want to make that explicit. You don't have to be Buddhist to do it. It's just, that's where it comes from. But second, um, it seems to me that like, if you diligently practice that and you practice it with other people that are practicing it, 
like that creates the kind of conditions for psychological safety such that that's just kind of shared intimacy becomes possible. You're, you're not going to have, I mean, say you have unkind speech, for example, so you, someone says something to you that feels hurtful, you're not going to open up to a group of people and like share what it's like to be you or feel safe to do that in a way that leads to like collective consciousness type experiences. You're going to close off and feel hurt and yeah. uh, it's not going to open into that. So like if you're interested in, in that kind of thing that James and I are talking about, like Buddhist right speech is like not, it's like not sufficient, but it's like a useful way to practice the kind of speech with others that would lead to that kind of thing like oh wow you said something that's true and useful and kind and timely like oh wow okay uh like that's a useful thing to say in this group and uh uh that if people are consistently doing that i think that's like the conditions for that kind of experience to arise yeah 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 and how much um of that um safety and belonging and security and you know uh, freedom you know as well but within within the context of some group uh, or a religion like mm -hmm. how much you know we we look at our disconnected atomized social media world these days uh, and we cry out of like oh what are we going to do religion is declining 30% of America identifies as no religion, you know, from 10% a couple decades ago, like huge swing uh, over a few decades. And all right, what's the, what's the replacement? Where do we get the good things uh, that were there when, you know, okay, some things are being rejected. And so entire frameworks are being rejected uh, in terms of maybe the, the, the scope or the mindset uh, or the, the, Kind of the totality of the worldview mm. uh there but um but yeah people are hungry right for connection and empathy and community and so yeah verveki and folks talk about like the religion that is not a religion mm. uh and you know okay what are we what are we going to construct for ourselves uh and how do we you know uh, just yeah where are those where are we going to where are we going to have those good things for ourselves? Um, I don't know if you have any particular, like, I'm curious about your relationship to Buddhism as a religion mm -hmm. uh, and, and Buddhism as a ecology of practices, say, mm -hmm. as a, as a contrast, uh, you know, and um, your relationship to, to all of that, but just how we, how we relate to, I suppose, even an in intentional society is one of these efforts uh, to kind of explore, well, what is, what is the kind of community uh, that we, that we want to make that is, that is meta aware and, you know, large perspective and integrates many, many, many things into its perspective. Uh, but the, the human, mm, just the, the meaningful, the, the, the substantive meaning of what it's, like to be human or what a what a good life almost uh feels like comes from uh, uh yeah comes from relationships hmm. uh and from having having good friends and good relationships and security and belonging and social uh social understanding and a sense of social belonging in a community um and safety in that and i don't know i'm I feel a bit janky here trying to put pull these words together. Um, but I don't know. It's just it's it's a space that that excites me and um gosh, yeah, I don't know. How do how do you relate to all of this? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there is that longing for like connection and meaning and purpose that's mm, not necessarily served by existing religions or cultures and uh, also isn't necessarily met by the contemporary Western culture, however you look at that. Uh, certainly, it, it neither of those really cut it for me. And on the one hand, I was like, oh, uh, the Western worldview and structures and institutions and cultural norms never resonated for me. Uh, I never felt 
I mean, it was like, it was like the thing that was on offer to me was like, go to school, get a job, have a family, you know, uh, then die. And it's like, that never felt compelling to me and um, still doesn't really. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, just what, what, what I found even in traditional religions felt like it wasn't really meeting me where I was at either in the contemporary society. So I think a lot of what my own spiritual path has been in my lifetime, you know, since I became curious about these things has been like, <clears throat> I don't know, trying to find a tradition that would meet the needs that I had, but meet me having those needs specifically. Mm -hmm. And um, to the extent that I found that, uh, learning what I could from that. So, so that's where Buddhism comes in of like, Buddhism seemed to speak to me quite a bit. Um, but on the other hand, it's like, I don't resonate with, um, how to put this, like the Buddhist traditions that I found, none of those felt like they quite served me. And, and that's what was compelling for me about Maple originally was like, oh, this seems like a community that is trying to serve Buddhist truths and practices to contemporary Westerners that would reach me. And then even then, I think ultimately it was like, this is something like 80 or 90% of what I want. And to get the last 10 or 20% of what I want, I, I have to go out and, and live it myself at this point. And that's what I'm doing. I mean, that's uh, the, the, the kind of thing that I'm doing with my life now is not something that uh, anyone I know has done. The closest person probably a big inspiration has been Peace Pilgrim. And I, I see her as a teacher to me more than anyone else at this point um, mm. because she was wandering and was trying to live her own wisdom to the best of her ability. And uh, of course it's different. I, I don't have her realization. Uh, and uh, I'm also extremely online and uh, I'm, I'm a Buddhist and have other things that I'm interested in, but, but sort of carving out one's own individual path and that's not in an existing structure um she's probably the person that resonates with me the most but yeah at this point it's sort of a fusion of buddhism and taoism and peace pilgrim and being extremely online you know uh mm -hmm. doing, doing a podcast and talking to lots of people and tweeting all the time and uh, i like that for me it feels like the right right livelihood in a buddhist sense for me like doing the thing that i'm doing which is not something I've seen anyone else do. And uh, yeah, I had, to, I had to carve that out for myself and uh, it's not easy. So yeah, I think that's why it's worth spreading these different practices and like a lot of what I at least had to do had, was sort of piecemeal and taking this from here and that from there. And that has risks and challenges and like safety issues even of like, oh, you might hurt yourself, but uh, it's what I had to do for myself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm yeah yeah thanks mm -hmm. yeah it's i think um I, I don't know as much as i'd like to about adult development but i think a lot of that process was sort of going from uh you know the third keegan stage to the fourth one of like self-authoring basically and like finding an account of who i am in this world that uh really felt right and none of the existing structures that were handed down to me felt like they could really help me thrive individually. And, um, you know, Maple was the closest thing that I found to that. And I'm, I'm really grateful to them for that. And, and I eventually had to leave and be like, I, I got to do my own thing now, guys. So mm. uh, that that's, that's what my own journey has looked like so far. And I'm sure it'll keep changing, you know. So curious to see where that goes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Is yeah. there anything else that you'd like to talk about related to any of these things or dive into more? Hmm. Yeah. I will I'll remain curious to see where it goes for you as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, no, it's been uh, it's been great talking. Yeah, likewise, James, thank you for sharing, uh, you know, your own life story with us and, uh, you know, telling us about this project you're up to and we'll be curious to see where it goes and uh, uh, you know, it reminds me, actually, you sent out an email a little while ago to allies, you know, I have an article on alliances on my blog. And so that, that caught my attention for sure. And hmm. uh, I think something I've realized recently is uh, 
I want this podcast to be sort of a venue for showcasing people and projects that I believe in and I'm excited about. And, you know, I don't have to like know everything about it or be involved myself or completely endorse everything about it because people are different and they do it differently than, than I would because they're different. And, uh, yeah. but it's like, Hey, if there's something good here, like I want it to be, um, something uh that people know about and can hear about and can participate in so so thank you for sharing your project with us i, I really appreciate it yeah and thank you for that um yeah that attitude uh and bringing that and certainly yeah there's the balance of like oh i want intentional society to be to be known about mm -hmm. uh but i don't want to present it as like the answer <laughs> or yes. the everybody should come join this thing because like no it's totally i know it's not for everybody and we we need to you know plant a thousand flowers mm -hmm. uh and let them all bloom not pick them <laughs> uh we're not looking for the one true flower yes um you know let a thousand flowers dot the countryside and create a landscape of beauty and thriving mm -hmm. so i think we need a thousand different communities out there uh exploring uh finding their own path uh trying to craft what is the way forward uh through the postmodern world uh and into the whatever the future beyond that is so yes. so yeah happy to to you know say to folks listen to this like ah, if this resonates with you yeah come check it out uh you can come see if it is for you and if it's not for you totally 100 percent fine that is great as well and like whether you go do your own thing and carve out your own life and carve out your own thing or find some other group anywhere like yeah just um but just live it you know mm -hmm. just live it and go for it and um yeah don't hold back <laughs> thank you for saying that i i couldn't agree more and uh may it be so may it be so <laughs> may it be so <laughs> thank you again friend thanks <laughs>